Ladies, gentlemen, and of course, everybody in between, welcome back to the Electrek Garage. I'm your host, as always, Declan Cav, and this is a Tesla Roadster, and this is Pete Gruber. Thank you for joining us here at the Auto Shop of the Future. They have a lot of Tesla Roadsters here. If you guys don't know who Pete Gruber is, well, you're not as much of a nerd as me, but Pete Gruber uh, started Gruber Motor Company here in Phoenix, Arizona, and they specialize in just repairing Tesla Roadsters. That's their entire game. And so you can see behind me, and we'll walk through it here in a second. How many Roadsters do you, do you know off the top of your head how many you have here right now? Usually they're about 50. Wow. Yeah. So I would say that's probably the biggest collection of Roadsters in one place. On the planet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are there any other shops who do this kind of work, or are you guys the only one? There is one up in Seattle. There are a few in Europe. And, uh, but yeah, the type of work that we do is unique in that we do it all from paint body to electronic rebuilding. Yeah, and we're gonna take a walk through some of their electronic shops here. Very impressive stuff as an EV nerd, love it. But yeah, so let's start taking a walk around the shop and uh, show off what Gruber Motor Company does. A lot of people actually don't realize that Tesla made this small sports car. You'd be surprised at how few people would look at this car and not recognize it as a Tesla, because obviously it doesn't look like any modern Tesla. So what was the start and what was the inspiration for the Tesla Roadster? Well, a couple of gentlemen, um, uh, Mark Tarpening and uh, Martin Eberhardt, who were the ones that um, originally incorporated Tesla. Not Elon Musk. Not Elon Musk, correct. Um, had just sold a e-books business. And they were looking for something else to get into. And one of them um, always liked sports cars, Martin Eberhardt. So he thought to himself, wouldn't it be fun to make an electric sports car? And along comes the T0 made by AC Propulsion Systems in San Dimas, California. And uh, three of them were built. They took one of these to Laguna Seca and began to realize that even though it only had an 80 mile range, the zero to 60 was four seconds. And they were embarrassing Lamborghinis and Ferraris and McLarens of the day. Well, the word spread and Martin Eberhardt found out about this car. He went to see AC Propulsion and asked, aren't you guys going to build this car? It has potential. They said, no, we're an engineering company. Our grant is exhausted. Um, if you want to do it, we'll give you one of the cars as a test mule and you can, you can create an electric sports car. So being small, kind of like this building here at the time, Tesla did not have the financial capability to build car bodies and chassis. So they went out in the industry looking for a car manufacturer that would sell them empty shells, empty um, sports cars without a drivetrain. And Lotus stepped up to the plate and said, ha, ah, how about the Lotus Elise? It's about the right size, kind of matches uh, the T0. And they went on contract to get 2,400 Lotus Elise cars to electrify. Well, it was a noble thought, a noble idea, but the reality was by the time they developed the battery pack, all thousand pounds of it, the, it would no longer fit into the Lotus Elise frame. And they, because they had to change the frame, they then had to change all the body panels. So everything that you see here is custom. And today, only 7% of the Tesla Roadster is Lotus Elise. You gotta, you gotta admire it, it's a, it's a piece of art. Cool, well now let's take a walk around the garage and just talk sure. maybe about some of the specs and some of the more interesting roadsters that you have in here. Okay. So let's start off with the specs. What's the horsepower and torque numbers of these cars? Well, the horsepower is 288 horsepower. The torque, I'm not sure, it's up there as well. They originally um, had a two-speed transmission in the Tesla Roadster. That's what that 1.5 stick shift was originally for, which they kept now in its reverse and forward rather than two speeds. But the reason they did away with that two speed transmission was the torque was burning up all the clutch plates and Borg Warner just could not create a product that would, uh, that would work long term. Yeah. Um, what we're standing in front of here is a very unusual Roadster in that it is Founder Series number three. Three, there we go. In the world of roadsters, there were engineering prototypes. These were cars that they beat to death to prove that they were uh, a proof of concept vehicle. They had validation prototypes, same purpose. And technically, none of those were supposed to be released in the field. But 
because there were some financial difficulties at times within Tesla in the early days, a lot of those cars escaped. So you'll see VPs out there, even an EP from time to time. But the next generation then that was actually sanctioned for public sale was the Founder Series cars. And these would typically, these would typically go to VIPs, venture capitalists, family members. Elon has founders number one. Martin Eberhard has founders number two. And this gentleman who worked for eBay, was an exec at eBay, has founders number three. And not only does he have founders number three Roadster, but he also has founders number three Model S in almost the same color. So these are being sold as a set. Yeah. What is also interesting with these early cars, they were basically hand built. And here, if you look at the, um, at the hood vanes, you can see that the carbon fiber weave is bleeding through the paint. Yeah, that's so cool. It's kind of a, like it's a signature of, on it. Exactly, it's part of the provenance. When the customer first sent us these cars, um, there was some discussion as to whether this should be repaired. My vote on it was leave it exactly as I is. I agree with that. It collectible. I, I don't like patina, but that's not patina. That's just a, a feature of being a hand-built car. Originality. Exactly. And, what are the uh, battery specs for these cars? So what's um, battery size and what's the range that you can expect from your Tesla Roadster? Um, so, the, the, um, so the battery spec for the legacy packs is 53 kW and uh, 400 volts, of course. Then in 2016, Tesla came out with a replacement battery pack for the Tesla Roadster, which now brought it up to 80 kW because instead of a 2.2 amp hour cell, they were using 3.2 amp hour cells. What we're standing in front of here is the three orphaned barn find China Roadsters. And there's an interesting story here as well. Uh, in 2010, there was a Chinese auto manufacturer that wanted to get into the EV space. And they could have hired engineers and uh, you know, started all over and reinvented the wheel, but they thought it would be far less expensive to simply buy some cars that are successful in the field. By 2010, the Roadster had been out for two years, and they planned to reverse engineer four cars. Yeah. They ended up going to China in sea containers but the company went bankrupt before they were able to start their reverse engineering process. These cars ended up being tucked into these sea containers and forgotten about. Fast forward to 2013, the fall of 20, or the uh, spring of 2013, and these things are discovered. Now they've been sitting in there in the dark for 13 years. They're brand new cars. They've never been titled. Um, and they ended up being sold to our customer currently who decided to offer these up for sale. What we found after these cars came here, initially they were going to be sold in China, then they were supposed to be transported to Dubai, and eventually the customer decided we really need to provide more disclosure on the condition of these cars, so they were shipped here. We ended up getting into the computer looking at all of the, um, uh, the log files, which are still live, by the way, in, this, in these cars, even though the battery's been dead for 13 years. And we found that there was some rodent damage. And it looks like they got into a bit more than the wiring, at least on a couple of cars, because when we fired them up, the, uh, the pumps, the coolant pumps will fire up, and uh, it's in the 12 volt system. And we found that coolant began to leak out of a couple of the cars. So currently these cars are up for bid. Uh, we had someone come by today actually and uh, do an inspection of the cars. And uh, if that sale goes through, then these will most likely be leaving within the next few weeks. So here we are in their lab. Pete, what's going on here? These are Tesla Roadster power electronic modules known as PEMS. And this is the three phase inverter that converts a whole bunch of DC to three-phase AC to drive a three-phase AC induction motor that Nikola Tesla invented. The three-phase boards are visible right here, A, B, and C. And uh, its function in life basically is to uh, create a good, clean three-phase sine wave so that that motor is happy. And what we're doing here is, in the world of electric vehicles, people don't consider the fact that they have deferred maintenance in completely different areas. And uh, here, for example, in this power electronics module, there are design problems from back in the day. Some of those are, there are resistors on a CIC board 
that are undersized and they heat up as they age and actually yeah. burn the board at some point. But the worst one is that little blue section there. That is the insulating material that shields IGBT transistors on the power boards from ground. And there's 400 volts on those transistors, around four to 500 amps. So when that insulating material finally gets compromised because it gets dry, brittle, and crumbles and shorts the ground, you have fireworks. Cool. And you, the last thing you want in this PEM is fireworks because these boards have been out of production since 2008. With a small customer base of around 2,000 owners, they'll probably never be in production again because the startup cost to recreate boards is extremely high and it would make the minimum order quantity ridiculous. Yeah. So what we do is repair and uh, repurpose these boards is vital. And we repair right down to component level. All right, so we're under a car. Yes. What, what is going on here? We're standing underneath a Tessa Roadster. It is a two-wheel drive vehicle, rear-wheel drive vehicle. And what we're looking at here is the three-phase AC induction motor. You can see the three phases coming in. And it's actually a little bit uh, smaller than what you see here because there's a heat sink around the outside. But what is remarkable about this AC, three-phase AC induction motor is, it's about the size of a crock pot, but it puts out 288 horsepower at zero RPM. That's what makes these things so lightning fast, is that off the line, there's very little that can beat something like this. From there, all of that uh, rotating power is converted into a transaxle, and then it comes out two half shafts here, which then drive the wheels. Now, this big empty cavity that we have here houses a thousand pound battery pack, which has 6,831 cells in it. You got that and, number down. Yes. <laughs> there are 11 sheets. Each of them holds 621 cells. And here we can see it exposed. And the reason we open it and expose it is because when there is a problem with one of the cells or one of the sheets, we're, we're now able to remove the sheet, diagnose, repair, put it back in. And then this 11 point charger actually brings all of the voltage levels on the sheets back up to the same voltage level which then balances the pack and provides maximum range once it goes back up inside the car. Yeah, so each of these modules is charging the individual modules in the pack Correct. independently. Correct, independently all, yeah, and uh, we have all 11 of them here. And with these DC to DC converters, we are able to dial in voltage and the charge current. That's so cool. Is this a custom made part here? Everything is custom here. You can't go on Amazon and buy Tesla Roadster, uh, you know, uh, uh, test equipment, power supplies, load banks. And what we do is we end up repurposing a lot of the product that we use in the critical power world and apply it here at the Groom Motor Company. Yeah, that's so cool. Another thing I wanted to bring up too is the motor. I've, I've worked with modern Tesla motors from Model S's and Model X's. It looks extremely similar, like the design language and what they kind of look like. It hasn't changed much. Mm -hmm. You could fool me that that's not a Tesla Roadster motor and I wouldn't know. So it's really cool to see that right. early te Tesla technology, but they still had an idea of what they wanted to do for their full company even back then. Because mm -hmm. you see almost that exact motor on their modern cars. Right. And One thing that actually Martin Eberhardt freely admits, and you touched on it, um, back in the day they had no idea what a multi-cell 18650 pack like this, how it would behave in a variety of situations puncture, collision, driving it into a lake. So they overcompensated in a number of different areas. Some of these packs actually even have a smoke detector in them. Wow, that's and so cool. They went way, way overboard with uh, safety. And uh, he felt that the later cars that came along, like the GM Volt, for example, or Bolt, um, they didn't spend enough time with those battery packs like they did, and that was the reason there were so many recalls. Remember even the Ford F-150 Lightning? But he freely admits they agonized over the design, and it's probably the most coddled battery pack in the EV world. It shows. It's a beautiful battery pack. I mean, all the battery packs nowadays are the same. You get those flat packs in the bottom of the car. This is engineering. This mm -hmm. is cool. So the reason the North American charge standard was developed is because this was the original Tesla Roadster charge plug. And it is a big, unwielding beast, especially to try to repair. And let's see what it looks like going into a Roadster. It puts this, CCS to shame in that size. Yeah. 
This being a Lotus Elise body, uh, simulated at least, this used to be the gas cap on the Elise. It became, later on, the charge port door on a Tesla Roadster. And you can see there is a uh, socket there that this will fit into. Now let me show you how cumbersome this gets. You have to line this up, twist, then there's a pilot signal that will um, allow you to charge, and it sticks out quite a bit. Um, that's probably the primary reason why the NACS standard was developed because this is much more um, or much less elegant than the uh, NAX Trident plug. It looks very engineered out. design to me. Yeah. Not very user friendly, but that's so cool that, and I imagine they make adapters for your, so you can charge on. We do, yes. In fact, that's what I was going to get, but then I realized the adapter has a dimple in it and it won't fit until I repair <laughs> it. So, but yeah, there is a can senior and a can junior that will do the same thing this does, except instead of having a cable come out, it will allow you to plug in a J1772 uh, cable plug or a Trident connector or the next standard. And then, so this does course, have DC fast charging? No, that's always oh. the next question. Oh, I can DC fast charge? This only has AC input. Gotcha. What's the charge time on it then? Um, with this, if it's depleted, it could be three days. Oh my gosh. With the uh, 240 volt cable or the 17 or the uh, large wall charger, which is 70 amps, it could be four hours or uh, you know eight hours or so. So not a great road trip car. It's not a great road trip car. You know, and uh, back in the day, when you took one of these on a road trip, there were no destination chargers. Yeah, exactly. In 2008, 2010 or so. So what people used to do was they carried a whole bunch of adapters in their trunk, plugs you know, different receptacles, and they would go to KOA campgrounds oh. and use the 240 volt um, uh, receptacles there, which like your dryer plugs, it can either be the triangular version or the straight blade 650. Yeah. And, uh, but that's how back then without destination chargers. So over here, you guys also need to find parts for a uh, broken roadster. So you guys find broken ones or buy broken ones and you harvest parts off of them. So what's the process like for finding these broken roadsters and then harvesting the parts for them? Well, in 2014, it was easy to find collision damage Tesla Roadsters at auction because they weren't yet collectible and they were usually selling for about $40,000 or so. Oh my so. gosh. Functioning Roadsters, mind you. Yeah. So we could pick cars up like this at Copart, IAA, Mannheim auctions, anywhere in the neighborhood of maybe fifteen dollars to $20,000, which still seems like a lot, but it's what put other cars back on the road because remember, we can't go to Tesla and buy fenders, hood uh, parts, you know, rear decks. They don't have any of those parts anymore and you can't go to Lotus because it's not a Lotus Elise. Yeah. It doesn't fit. So we had plenty of scavenger or donor cars that we could pick from back then. And then something interesting happened. Tesla Roadster started to become collectible. And what happens now is everybody that sees these at auction gets starry eyed and says, oh my God, I can get an inexpensive Roadster. These two here cost us about $55,000 a piece. Oh my goodness. And they aren't really the types of cars that you can put back on the road. Yeah. Um, so that's the story on these cars is that uh, we, are, um, we are using these for parts, certain parts we can recreate, uh, like the 3D printed parts that I yeah. showed you. The, the, uh, the electronics, like the HVAC controller under here, we rebuild those. The Spall fans, those are um, still available. You can go to Spall and buy those. We even were able to uh, find these AC condensers, but certain proprietary parts are no longer available. Gotcha, that's really cool. So just for reference, what is the going price? Say I come in here, I wanna buy a brand new, mint condition driving Tesla Roadster. What would that cost me? Okay, a year ago, I would have said 120 to $130,000 for a non-pedigreed car. And what I mean by that is a pedigreed car is one with a low VIN, yep. uh, celebrity owned, of course, you know, special status of some type. Um, today, uh, bring a trailer, for example, has been uh, fetching around seventy-five to eighty-five thousand dollars for fully functioning roadsters. Yeah, it's lower than it's ever been, and there's a huge glut of roadsters available right now. The inventory is too high, basically. Yeah. Hey, that's a good thing for people like me who don't have a roadster but want one. Yes. Just keep watching my videos. Eventually I'll have the ad rev. I think I've made 80 bucks off YouTube at this point. Right. So what's that, a thousand times that? I'll be there. Yeah, you need a lot more. Yeah. Just a little bit. Someday. Now you might ask, well, should we be parting out good roadsters? 
Tesla began doing that about three years ago or so, they also realized they had a part shortage. Yeah. They came to us for parts. They cleaned us out as well. What they began to do was take trade-ins. So mm. you could essentially, and it was at the time that the Model 3 was coming out, yeah. you could trade in your roaster on a Model 3. Yeah, that's insane. Quite a step, a step up in some regards, but also a step down in others, going from a well, roaster to a 3. For the investors, it was a benefit in that it thinned the herd. Yeah, for it sure. It took even more roadsters out of play. Yeah. But um, from a um, collectible standpoint, yes, it was a benefit. Of course, people are upset that their cars ended up being parted out. Yeah, that's a big uh, thing that happens in a lot of car communities, myself being the uh, de facto leader of the Unique Mobility Electra community. We have a couple cars that could be used as parts cars, but just trying to decide, like, is it worth, because they're so rare and they're such right. historical pieces, deciding if it's worth taking that car apart is a really hard process. Mm -hmm. So what, in at Gruber Motor, what qualifies a car for being a parts car versus like, okay, we can fix this? Well, um, I have an issue with the staff here because these cars were purchased as test mules. Sure. And um, five months later, I come over and they're stripped for parts. Mm. Um, so there's, there's that dichotomy that often exists. What should they be used for? Um, you know, it's not impossible to put these cars back on the road, but at this point in time, based on valuation, it's not cost effective. Yeah. So here we are in the battery lab. Is that what you call it? Or you call yeah, that? battery bunker. Or battery, battery bunker, land. love that. And so explain to me what you guys do here and what's going on. Well, in this self-contained steel building, completely separate from the main building, if we ever had a fire again, it would be contained this time instead of affecting any cars. Yes. The goal with this building was to take any kind of battery maintenance that uh, takes the cells or the sheets out of the safe environment in the car and contain it in this building. And what we're doing here is, these are Tesla Roadster sheets. There is a 50 amp, 50 volt power supply there that is running voltage along these bus ducts. And by the way, all of this is repurposed from our critical power. These came out of UPSs. Cool. Um, and we have two different types. We have these adapter plates that allow us to do either a Tesla Model S or X module, as they call it. And we simply cover up what is normally the, um, uh, the section for the Roadster sheet. And we can now charge each uh, module or sheet at either the brick level, or in this case, at the sheet level, which in this case is 36 volts across the, um, uh, the Tesla Roadster sheet. Yeah. What we're using, which is tapping into that 50 amp, 50 volt power supply is DC to DC converters that then are able to dial in any voltage we want, any current we want. And uh, these sheets are donor sheets. They are being kept on life support for a roadster that is going to need an entire sheet. Gotcha. N normally we can repair right down to brick level, but if we have too many cells that have um, uh, died in that brick, then an entire sheet replacement is necessary. Um, the reason this is important is Tesla does not sell individual sheets. And even if they did, they would be the new generation 3.0 sheets, which yeah. do not play with the 2.2 amp hour cells, because yeah. uh, they're 3.2 amp hour. So this is the way that we keep the legacy roadsters alive with these uh, sheets kept on life support. So we're going handheld mode here for a second, uh, because uh, first off, it's a two-seater, and uh, we can't fit a camera guy in here, but Pete's actually gonna take me for a ride. I've never ridden in a roadster before, so, okay. I, Kind of almost got that, uh, you got the uh, push. Oh my goodness. This is low. It's small. Okay, I'm six foot three. So this is a bit of a fit. Reminds me a lot of my brother's MGB. And it doesn't help that these door sills are so wide. So yeah, this is a uh, uh, a test drive car. This went 3,300 miles. My God, it's low mileage too. Wow. All right, so do you want me to talk about how we uh, started up and everything? Sure. Okay. So take the emergency off. We've got push buttons on this since this is a 2.0 Roadster. Sure. The 1.5s had that stick shift I was telling you about that yeah. uh, at one point was two speed. And uh, just put it in drive, perfectly silent. When you turn the ignition on, it just beeps. And uh, here we go. Very cool. Yeah, why, uh, for what reason are the doors still so wide in this thing? Uh, well, um, it was an afterthought in many ways. In fact, Elon um, 
complained about the height of the sills, and that was another reason they had to change the frame. Yeah. Because the Lotus version was higher than even this. We have a number of customers, by the way, that have begun to sell their roadsters because they can't do the roadster wiggle anymore, get in and out of the car. Oh, that makes they're getting they're getting too old. Some have had back surgeries, can't get in and out anymore. Uh, the latest one was knee surgeries. Um, and of course, yeah, they can't get in and out of the car anymore. Yeah, that's too bad. But that's yeah, I, I, that's not even something I think about. But yeah, even be, as I'm I'm 20 years old, mm -hmm. but I mean I'm I'm six foot three and I, I struggle to get into the car. It's a challenge. Yes, it is. That's part of the fun. No, I always I always love the natural sound of an electric motor. You get all these cars. <laughs> it's a little sporty. Um, you get all these cars nowadays though, that put this fake motor noise. Like you got what was an Audi who had Hans Zimmer. Oh, yeah. But people don't realize electric motors have a good noise. They just cover it up. Yeah. I mean, my unique mobility electric has this amazing loud motor whine, and this car has it too. I hope it picks up on the mics. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, I'll put it in over. Um, but you, oh. All right. So that's full throttle there. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is a fast car. <laughs> it is. Zero to 60 on this, if it's a sport, yeah. is 3.7 seconds. It feels, it feels like it has some acceleration to it. Yeah. My it's electric cars aren't this fast. Oh my gosh. Oh! And what's great, <laughs> <laughs> what's great about it being an electric car, you get that full torque at any speed. So, I mean, you pull up next to somebody in traffic and they're, they're annoying you on the highway. Yeah. And what did you say the top speed of this car is? It's only 130 because it's only a single speed transmission. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, if it makes you feel better, my car's top speed is 80. 80, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can hear that whine. Yeah, it's beautiful. No power steering, no power brakes. It's just who you, needs it? The car and your skills, yes. And uh, yeah, roadster owners really enjoy that, uh, you know, tactile feel. Yeah, it, it's the uh, enthusiast electric car. You see a lot of these uh, electric cars selling to middle-aged moms nowadays. But I mean, you get this car, no power steering, no, nothing, nothing fancy, mm -hmm. but it's just fun. Right, right, exactly. So what made you want to start uh, Gruber Motor Company? Uh, my wife and I were driving a Prius and I was fascinated by being able to drive on electric power. Yeah. Even though it was only a mile or so under 30 miles an hour. And um, anyway, by 2014, uh, I'm, I'm going to punch it again. Oof. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> it just won't stop. Yeah, it's so fast. Uh, it's fine, it's fine. And everybody has a roadster grin when they do that. Oh my gosh, yes. No, that's so funny though that your fascination with a super cool fast electric sports car started with a Prius. A Prius, exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Arguably one of the slowest and least respected cars in the car world. Although I would argue one of the best you can buy if you're on a budget. Yeah, and always being in electronics, of course, um, you know, being able to drive on electric power is just fascinating to me. So I, um, I started looking for electric cars. Couldn't find anything interesting. And I ended up finding a car on eBay. It was a black Tesla Roadster. Yeah. Love the styling. Called them up and they said, look, um, I can't tell you who it is. I'm his publicist, but it's a well-known actor that you would immediately recognize. And I put two and two together. It was George Clooney's car. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You, are you saying you own George Clooney's? No. Okay, you no, didn't buy that one. What ended up happening was I decided before I fly to LA and I almost had my tickets, um, let me check with a friend of mine in town here who I knew had a Tesla Roadster. He said, I love the car. I've got two little girls and that airbag will not turn off. So we're getting rid of the car, even though I love it. And we struck a deal and I got my lightning green 2011 Tesla Roadster. Love that. Do you still have it? No, it burned up in the fire. Oh, that's so, yeah, uh, that's so upsetting. That's so cool though. I love that story. Pete, thank you so much for having me out here. Honestly, when I emailed you guys, I did not expect to get a response. So I was so excited to have the opportunity to come out and film with these awesome cars. Our pleasure. We always enjoy showing off Tesla Roadsters. As you should. They are cool cars. Oh my gosh. Years, years later down the line when I'm rich and famous and the next Elon Musk, I'll get myself a Tesla Roadster. But until then, thank you so much. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, if you guys ever need interns, hit me up. I'm See, there you go. Yeah. Hey, I worked in film too, so if you need film interns, hit me up. But yeah, thank you so much, Pete. Yeah, our pleasure.
All right, guys, that's gonna be it for this video. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing. It means a lot to me and I can exploit you for the ad revenue. You can also leave a nice comment and tell me how sexy I am. Um, if you wanna know more about Grouper Motor Company, um, I'll have other stuff right here. And also their links will be in the descriptions and the comments below. Go check out Gruber Motor Company. Super cool company, absolutely love them. Thank you so much to the Gruber for letting me come out here and film with these cars. Like I said, I don't know why they let me do that. But you know, they did and here we are. Again, thank you so much for Gruber for letting me come out and film these cars. And I will see you all in the next video. Love you.